Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer. Glad you're with us. And this evening or this morning, whenever you're watching the program, we will be teaching on praying for revival. Revival means someone was alive, died, and now is brought back to life. Revival, resurrection of the dead, dry bones that are mentioned in Ezekiel 37, hearing the word of the Lord. So we want to start off reminding us of our new life in Christ through baptism. Lord, bless everyone. And let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus. May we come to life. May we live a resurrected life. Lord, may we pray as we've never prayed before. May we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this now in Jesus' name. May that person give his life to you. That one be healed. That one set free. That one repent. That one forgive. Lord, do your mighty works even as we pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Amen. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, we're talking about praying, and especially in the context of revival. Personal revival, but more than that, revival of a church, revival of a city, revival of a nation, revival of a world. We're going to start off with Isaiah in chapter 56 and verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7, the Lord says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. When our houses, that is our families, our churches our gatherings, our ministries, when these corporate groups are houses of prayer, brothers and sisters, guess what? We are going to see the glory of God. We're going to see the promises of the Bible fulfilled. We're going to see people come to Christ by the thousands and millions, and we're going to see the last preparations before Christ comes again. Let me throw out another scripture here for you. Revelation, excuse me, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and petition, and they shall look on him whom they have thrust through. So the Lord says at a certain point, and the context here is, Really, the end times, or at least the messianic times. At a certain point, God is going to pour out a spirit of grace and petition. And when that happens, and then when that is received, what happens next is the glory of God. Revival, evangelization, great breakthroughs. It's just so fantastic. So I'd like to give you some examples of this. In Acts of the Apostles. And Acts of the Apostles really show clearly the connection between prayer and revival. One of the verses in the, in the Bible that mean something extra special to me is Acts 1 and 14. And here they are in the upper room praying for the Holy Spirit for the first Pentecost. Acts 1 14, it says, Together they devoted themselves to constant prayer. There were some women in their company and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Together they devoted themselves to constant prayer. Now, after that nine-day gestation period, there was the birth of 
the church. As a baby is in the womb for nine months and then is birthed, so the church, in at least one way of looking at it, was in the womb for nine days. And in that novena, that nine days of prayer, that church was given birth. So here we see nine days of prayer resulting in the birth of a church. 3,000 people come to Christ on that one day. You see, nine days of prayer, 3,000. Now, you say, I wish we had 3,000. Well, why don't you do the nine days of prayer? You say, well, I did, but that doesn't do it. Well, you, well, you better listen to God about this. Well, let, let's go on a little bit here. Acts 2, 42, after they received the Holy Spirit, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' instruction, the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. They really devoted themselves to prayer. You can see a little bit of this mentioned in Acts 3, where they went up to the temple for the three o'clock hour of prayer, while in their homes they broke bread, meaning what we would call Eucharist. So they were praying at home, they were praying at the temple. They were praying, they were praying, they were praying. Okay, after that prayer, guess what happened? Well, this lame man, 40 years old, never walked a day in his life, lame from birth, was healed. Peter used the occasion to proclaim the risen Christ. And what happened? Acts 4, verse 4. Many of those who had heard this speech believed the number of men came to about 5,000. Now, we don't know how many totally came to Christ, but just counting the men, it was 5,000. Now, if we want to just say like the 3,000 that came to the Lord at Pentecost, say it was 50-50, 50% 50 men, 50% women. Just, just say that. Well, um, That means 1,500 men. Now, this means 5,000. This says 5,000 men. So that means 3,500 more men. And then who knows how many more women. Maybe that's 3,500 more women. Who knows? But um, it's, it's quite possible that this Acts 4-4 means several thousand more people. And it was preceded by this devoting oneself to prayer. Okay, you, you see how this works? Now, Peter and John are arrested after leading so many people to the Lord. And when they get out of jail, first thing they do, when you get out of jail, you, you'd, you'd probably go to your lawyer's office or make a run for it. Or, but first thing they do, Acts 4, 24, all raised their voices in prayer. All raised their voices in prayer to God on hearing the story about Peter and John in jail. Then um, in Acts chapter 6, we hear about a problem they had with the distribution of the food in the community of the early church. And um, they decided to appoint seven men to be deacons and to help in the administration of this food and of the, of the distribution of the food. And this was to permit, this is Acts 6, 4, this was to permit us, that is the apostles, to concentrate on prayer and the ministry of the word. So... We, keep, we hear about them praying some more. The, the leaders were concentrating on prayer. All the members of the church were devoted to prayer. Even out, in jail, they were praying. Out of jail, they were praying. At home, they were praying. At the temple, they were praying. They were praying, 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 just as Jesus said, pray always and don't lose heart. Never stop praying, 1 Thessalonians 5. And then we see, what was the result? Acts 6, 7. Chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God continued to spread while at the same time a, the number of the disciples in Jerusalem enormously increased. Enormously increased. Now we use that adverb enormously, usually relating to debts or problems. But the number of disciples enormously increased, but there was all that prayer going on, brothers and sisters. All right, now Stephen prays even while being attacked 
and right before he is murdered. Now, that's a hard time to pray. Jesus did it. But, but Stephen did it, an invitation of Jesus. And he prayed two prayers. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he said, Lord, don't hold the sin against them. And the result of that prayer was Saul turning to the Lord, becoming Paul, the great persecutor, becoming the great missionary. Further results of that prayer and the whole praying church was a whole Samaritan town coming to Christ. We read about that in Acts 8. And then the gospel being taken to the ends of the earth, as Jesus said would happen in Acts 1.8, it happened when Philip converted and baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he took the gospel to Ethiopia, and that's how it got to the ends of the earth. So you see the effects of praying? They were praying no matter what. They were praying even if they were being killed. They were praying anywhere. Now, notice in Acts 9, when the Lord sends Ananias to, to lead Paul to the Lord and fill him with the Holy Spirit and heal him of blindness. This is what the Lord says about Paul. He doesn't say, well, we, we knocked, him, knocked him on the ground. He's blind. They don't say that. They don't say, well, this is the, the terrible enemy of the church, but we finally uh, got, got through to him. What do they say about, about this man, um, this man Paul? This is in Acts 9, and the Lord is speaking to, the, um, to Ananias before Ananias goes to Straight Street and leads Paul to the Lord. Uh, the Lord says in Acts 9, 11, Go at once to Straight Street, at the house of Judas and asked for a certain tall sarsis. So he just gives the address. Well, you need to do that, obviously, or you wouldn't know where to go. And then and this, is, this is all the Lord says. This, he says, he's there praying. He doesn't say there, he's there blind, or he's there after being knocked to the ground, or he's there having been, been just kind of completely uh, overwhelmed by my power. You think they bring up that? He doesn't mention he's blind. He doesn't mention what happened to him. He just says he's there praying. You say, well, that's not the important matter. The important matter is he's been struck blind, that he had this light hit him, and that he's been, that he's been humbled and he's ready to convert. The Lord doesn't mention any of that stuff. He just says he's there praying. Praying, praying. That's what it's all about. What we think are the incidental details are the main details. You see what I mean? What if somebody asks you, what are you doing today? And you say, well, I went to work and I did that and, and uh, I had to pay these bills and then this came up and somebody called me here. You know what you ought to say? Even if you um, were real world famous, you say, well, about the big thing about today was I was praying. I was praying. You, you, you see that? All right. Well, Acts 10, Cornelius, uh, one of the first people uh, among the Gentiles to hear the gospel. How is he introduced? Acts 10, verse 2. Cornelius was in the habit of giving generously to the people, and he constantly prayed to God. He constantly prayed to God. Now, how could Peter receive Cornelius' messengers and minister the gospel to Cornelius' household? Acts 10, verse 9. About noontime the next day, as the men were traveling along and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof terrace to pray, to pray. All right, Acts 12, they have an all-night prayer vigil, and they spring Peter out of jail shortly before he was going to be executed. Acts 13, they're spending time in prayer and worship in the church of Antioch. And the result, first missionary journey. Prayer in Antioch, revival. Revival in the first missionary journey. Well, we could go through uh, several other ones, but I think you get the idea. Acts the Apostles, there's this pattern. Pray, the great evangelization. Pray, more great evangelization. Pray, the number of disciples enormously increased. Pray the gospel to the ends of the earth. Pray whole town comes to Christ. Pray Gentiles receive the message. Pray Saul's converted and turns into Paul. 
pray Cornelius and his household, these Gentiles, come to Christ. You get the idea? Pray, first missionary journey. Pray the glory of God. You see the pattern? We need to pray like we never prayed before. And that we should be praying always, but we need a certain amount of formal prayer every day in order to make sure that when we're not praying formally, we're still in that spirit of prayer. Now, let me just read something from our Pope. When he began his, his ministry as a Pope in 1979, it's his first encyclical, his first letter to the Christians of the world. This is 79, and this is how he ended this first letter, this first encyclical, and it's the last paragraph or two. And he says, this is an astounding prophetic statement. He quotes uh, John 15, 5, and he says, We hear within us as a resounding echo the words that Jesus spoke. So he says, inside of me, it's kind of like an echo. And, and what are the words that are echoing inside the Pope when, as he began his public, his ministries as Pope? The, the words are, John 15, 5, Apart from me, that is Jesus, you can do nothing. And then the Pope says, We feel not only the need, he says it's not only necessary to pray, but he says it's even more than necessary. Now, what's more than necessary? Well, in the English translation, and probably is worse than the original Latin, it just really gets into some big words here. We feel not only the need, but even a categorical imperative, which means it's not only necessary, but it's absolutely positively downright have to do it necessary. But even a categorical imperative, and he mentions three qualities of prayer that we've just got to have. Great, intense, and growing prayer, says, well, by, by some of the nuns who are contemplatives or by the priest or by certain people who are really into prayer groups and things like that. No, he says, great, intense, and growing prayer by all, by all the church. So the Pope is saying what I've just said from Acts of the Apostles. We absolutely positively got to pray like we never prayed before. And that doesn't just mean a few people here and there. It means all the church. Great, growing, and intense prayer. In case you want to read this yourself, it's the Redeemer of Man, the first encyclical letter of the Pope and his papacy. Then he goes on. This is quite an unusual prophetic statement. Only prayer can prevent. Notice that word only. You say, well, if I try hard, if I make great sacrifices, if I preach the gospel, if I minister healing. No, those are all great things to do, but those are, are not going to do what's a certain thing. It says only prayer, not, not prayer or something else, but only prayer can prevent all these great succeeding tasks and difficulties from becoming a source of crisis and make them instead the occasion and, as it were, the foundation for ever more mature achievements on the people of God's march towards the promised land in this stage of history approaching the second millennium. Wow. Well, that's a big sentence. But uh, he says the work that we're doing for the Lord will backfire on us and, and really end up causing more harm than it does good. Not, not that we try that, but things sometimes happen that you don't really have control of. He says, only prayer will prevent our works from backfiring on us. So there is, again, this mention of we've got to pray like we've never prayed before. Those three adjectives, great, growing, and intense prayer by all, all, all the church. Now let me give you just two other examples of what I'm saying. Two of the, the most important moments in the history of the human race. One Calvary. Before Jesus saved us, redeemed us, was our justification. Before he did all this, he spent well years of prayer, but that night before, he said, he said to the apostles, Could you not watch one hour with me before I die? And so he prayed that agony prayer. And guess what? 
the ultimate revival, Jesus' saving death and glorious resurrection. Bishop Sheen in many of his retreats would close by challenging the people, spend one hour a day with the Lord in personal prayer, in, in quiet time, one hour a day with the Lord. Not one hour including like the prayer meeting or the mass or the other kind of services and stuff like that, but one hour of, of what some people might call private prayer, just just you and the Lord. One hour a day of this. And he, his idea was that you wouldn't just do it 15 minutes here and a half hour there, but it would be one hour straight. Now, whether you do that or not, well, I guess you have to talk to God about it. But as we conclude this teaching, I want to get past the, the just reading the Bible and saying how wonderful this is and, and how John Wesley and, and Billy Graham and person after person would, would, would just go with this and say exactly what the Pope said and exactly what the Bible said. They say, we got to pray, 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 pray for before we can expect revival. But let's get past just the, the, the exhortations and the information into, well, what about it? What are you going to do about this? Now, I don't know what God wants of you, but I think at least a, a clear-cut beginning would be at an hour of, of private prayer, of personal prayer between you and the Lord each day. And you say, I can't do that. I, I'm lucky to pray five minutes. Well, why don't you then just start with five, and then maybe every couple weeks you can add on five until you get up to an hour. I say, well, I wouldn't know what to do. Well, we could talk to you. There's a lot of books out on different ways of of doing what people call their quiet time or their devotions or their personal prayer. Uh, so you could always get those books. Mostly you just praise God, read something from the Bible, intercede, and praise God. That's, that's what it comes down to. A uh, format in the church that has been used for centuries is, is called the Liturgy of the Hours. And there's an opening song of praise. Of course, you can praise more than that. Then there's reading of the Psalms and maybe a little other other readings, and then there's intercession, and, and that's that. But I'd, I'd bring some praises in there at the end. So anyway, it gives you the idea. And one other, one other reference, I mentioned it before. This is the, the one that stands out to me, is that, that prayer before Pentecost. I myself, in, um, in 1975, in May, without really being too uh, committed or, or really fully aware of what I was doing, just kind of almost accidentally, of course it was God's grace, but it seemed kind of accidentally to me, tried to devote myself to constant prayer in preparation for Pentecost, like it says in Acts 1.14. I really didn't understand what I was doing. I wasn't so serious about it. I just kind of did it without really... It's almost as a kind of circumstances kind of had turned out that I ended up doing this without me really making a big commitment to it. Uh, but that was, that was a great, great transformation in my life. And, and the, the change uh, was preceded and accompanied by this great increase of prayer. As far as private prayer goes, I'd probably pray the rosary sometime and uh, then I would you know have a lot of public prayers like masses and stuff maybe read the Bible a little bit just a little bit but um, I was uh, you know I would you know as far as any personal prayer I would just be a few minutes here and there but I was praying with groups other than that and then all of a sudden I God gave me the grace to just pray for really you know, hours. And this wasn't because I was greatly disciplined or anything. It was just God was giving me the grace. I had to go along with it. And wow, it was, it was just what I said. That Acts 114 is one of the most important scriptures in my whole life because I saw it, the same thing in my life. That prayer, that, that devoting oneself to constant prayer just leads to, to Pentecost to 
a new Pentecost. So all I can say is the Bible says it, the Pope says it, preachers say it, various denominations say it, the experience of Christians throughout the century say it. There's no question about it. We've got to pray like we've never prayed before. And if we can just let do it, and he said, I don't have the discipline. Well, the Lord will give it to you, but you've, the Spirit will provide. So would you pray one hour? Now, we're going to pray about praying. Now, right now, you say, no way, I can't do it. I've never been able to do this before in my life. And Well, that's why we're praying. We're not praying because it's already done. We're praying because it needs to be done. Let's pray. Father, we see what, you've, what you're telling us. It's so obvious. We're watching TV five hours a day on the average, and if we were praying five hours a day on the average, the whole world would be dramatically different. And so, Lord, we ask that we would be able to spend at least one hour a day in private prayer. Lord, if we're not even close to that, may we be able to at least start where we are five minutes and then, and then just add on five minutes until we're praying at least an hour a day. And for some, it would be more than that. But Lord, may our houses be houses of prayer so our houses would be houses of revival and life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. We remove all the obstacles, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Mighty one, lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb.